Can you hear me? Yes, you can. Sorry. I woke up half the room. Um, good evening. It's a pleasure to see so many of you on this um, um, you know, day at the Minier Drawing Institute. And my name is Edward Kopp. I'm chief curator of the Minier Drawing Institute. Uh, and it's my pleasure to introduce this lecture by Edith Devini. She's going to talk about um, Motherwell's uh, position in 20th century American art, and she's going to try and situate him more closely within the abstract expressionist movement. And tonight's lecture has been organized in conjunction and uh, collaboration with the Daedalus Foundation, the uh, foundation established by Robert Motherwell uh, before he passed away. And it uh, coincides with the current exhibition, uh, Robert Motherwell Drawing as Fast as a Man Itself, which is on, March, uh, on view March, um, through March 12th. And it's the most comprehensive um, retrospective of his drawings in decades, and it traces the full arc of his career uh, from the 1940s all the way to the 1980s and beyond. And the exhibition uh, was um, meant to coincide with the publication of a major piece of scholarship, namely the catalogue raisonné of the drawings of Motherwell. So the two, uh, both the catalogue raisonné and the um, exhibition really uh, came to fruition at the same time. And in case you'd like to see the show again or to see it for the first time if you haven't already done so, it will be open until 8.30 after the lecture. And also I have to say, it's my duty, that copies of the catalogue raisonné and also of the Motherwell catalogue are on sale um, at the Minier Bookstore. And as always, all the Minier programs are free uh, and open to everyone. And we've got a, a full um, schedule of programs for the weeks and the month ahead, so please check our website. And a few practical details before we start. Uh, please silence your cell phones if you haven't already done so. And Edith's lecture will be about 50 minutes in length, and then she's kindly agreed to take some questions. And please keep your question until the end. And when you have a question, raise your hand, and a microphone will be brought over to you. And the program is being recorded, and it will be made available in the next few weeks on the Minil's YouTube channel. And now it's my pleasure to introduce Edith Devini. So she's a London-based curator who has focused on a practice on modern and contemporary art. And amongst the many exhibitions he has created and written for are David Hockney, A Bigger Picture in 2012, Abstract Expressionism in 2016, and Jasper Jones, Something Resembling Truth in 2017. All these shows were curated and organized at the Royal Academy in London. And other exhibitions of hers include Arshai Golki, 1904 to 1948, and that was in 2019 at the Capesaro Museum in Venice. And at the same institution, she also curated Afro in 2022. And then finally, Milton Avery at the Modern Art Museum in Fort Worth, the Wordsworth Athenaeum in Hartford, Connecticut, and then the final venue was the Royal Academy of Arts. So we're so grateful that uh, she has agreed to come all the way um, from the UK to deliver this lecture, and please join me to welcome her. Thank you, Edward. Thank you very much. Um, it, it's an honor to be invited to give this lecture, and I'm very grateful to the Menil Drawing Institute and the director of the Menil, Rebecca Rabinow, for inviting me to do so. And I also want to share my gratitude with the curator of this wonderful exhibition of Motherwell Drawings, Edward, and, and Katie Rogers, um, uh, Vice President and Programs Director of the Daedalus Foundation. Both Edward and Katie have been unstinting in their assistance and have shared their considerable knowledge with great generosity. And indeed, given Edward's research and insight garnered during the development and delivery of this wonderful exhibition of Motherwell's drawings, As Fast as the Mind Itself, and Katie's formidable scholarship, as is in evidence in the catalogue resume of Motherwell's drawings, which was published at the end of last year, it is not my intention to attempt to direct much further illumination on Motherwell's drawings, a subject which they have both con con covered so comprehensively. And in any case, attempts on my part would fall well short of their recent academic research. 
but rather in this lecture and in celebration of both the completion of the catalogue resume of drawings and the presentation of this exhibition, I will take the opportunity to extend out the focus on Motherwell's career as an artist and to consider him within the cultural context of his time. And to an extent, through an interrogation of both his drawings and painting practice, I will examine his position within American modern art in general and his unique role within the development of the abstract expressionist movement in particular. For an artist and an intellect who amassed a great knowledge of art and cultural history and who himself was able to broaden an understanding of art and artistic movements into a wider cultural context, and for an artist who had a passion for discussing and debating his subject, Motherwell's thinking and articulation of his views on art, as well as his own practice, are well documented and his carefully constructed and highly informed pronouncement save for posterity. His words allow for much understanding and interpretation as to his own development and thinking as an artist, as well as his indefatigable engagement to both assimilate and inform on the subject of art and culture. <clears throat> Perhaps the most often repeated from the very rich trove of Motherwell's quotes is something he wrote in 1951 for a catalogue for an exhibition on the New York School in California. He wrote, every intelligent painter carries the whole culture of modern painting in his head. It is his real subject of which everything he paints is both an homage and a critique and everything he says, a gloss. The universality of this clear-sighted statement chimes with other similar notions articulated by fellow abstract expressionist artists, but none were quite so clearly expressed. But this pronouncement also suggests the extent to which the culture of modern painting dominated M Motherwell's own thinking, and how the very weight of this knowledge and understanding impacted on the manner in which he was able to approach his own work. It is perhaps unsurprising that given his intellectual bent and ease of communication, Motherwell found himself in the position of being a sort of spokesperson for the artistic movement of which he was a part. This unofficial role ended up becoming a responsibility for Motherwell, but one which he appeared to shoulder with magnanimity. As a young curator working in London, I came into contact with several British artists who had come of age and left art school in the late 1950s and early 60s, artists such as John Hoyland and Derek Beauchir. And it was from then, them that I first heard stories of their early fascination with abstract expressionism and the American exponents of the movement, and how this eventually brought them to America to discover it firsthand. And it was Motherwell who agreed to meet with them, inviting them to his studio to discuss their art, as well as his, and in many cases forming lifelong friendships. It was clear from the recounting of these visits many decades later what a formative experience this had been for these emerging British talents. That an artist of Motherwell's stature would take time to meet artists from another country who were just out of school. From the benefit of hindsight, it was also clear that this encounter had in some way shaped the British artist's future development. Even now, looking back a number of decades later, it appears to have been a very selfless act. And it was not a one-off, for there were many other such stories of young artists benefiting from Motherwell's time and interest. But what it tells us about Motherwell and the self-imposed responsibility he continued to shoulder well into maturity to be both spokesperson for and upholder of the collective ideas which underpin the abstract expressionist movement and all his exponents is fascinating. It wasn't that the other abstract expressionist artists didn't connect and befriend artists from other nations. We know, for example, that Rothko got to know British artists William Turnbull and, and William Scott, and de Kooning and Guston befriended the Italian artist Afro. There are many examples of such encounters and friendships. But apart from Motherwell, these were mostly with peers. Motherwell appeared to make a concerted effort to reach out to new generations in a committed pattern, almost as if it was a responsibility and a mission, albeit one that he fully embraced. And it appears that this sense of mission and duty was one that was from the beginning, uh, was with him from the beginning of his career and was very much formed from his own experience as an emerging artist. 
By the stage that Motherwell was meeting recent art graduates from the UK in the late 1950s and early 60s, abstract expressionism had reached the height of its powers in America, and new artistic tendencies were being already being established and coming to the forefront. However, in Britain and Europe, abstract expressionism had only really just begun to gain traction. The MoMA organized the New American Painting Exhibition, and this is a slide from a, one of the um, installations of it in Europe. Um, it toured to um, eight venues across Europe to mixed reviews. And in 1958, the exhibition, which was reportedly sponsored by the CIA, perhaps the reason that the collection of recent works was given the more nativistic title, The New American Painting, rather than the movement's own, particularly as abstract expressionism as a label for this group, had been in usage for over a decade, both in America and further afield. Included in this large touring exhibition was the work by 17 abstract expressionist artists, with each represented by four or five paintings spanning a period of from 1948, when it was generally agreed that the movement commenced and going up to the late 1950s. Motherwell was represented by five paintings. For many in Europe, this exhibition was an opportunity not only to discover um, works by these key American artists, but also to compare their work and determine the areas of shared intent as well as points of divergence which is something I want to look at here as I consider the broad trajectory of Motherwell's artistic career. One of the points that MoMA's founding director, Alfred Barr, was at pains to make in the introduction to the catalogue for the 1958 touring exhibition when discussing this group of artists, the majority of which he would have known personally, was their independence. He wrote, "'None speaks for the others any more than he paints for the others. Their individualism is uncompromising, and, it as a, and as a matter of principle, they do nothing in their work to make communication easy. It would be hard to imagine that any of the 17 artists included would have disagreed with Barr's statement. But seen in the light of Motherwell's giving voice to the concerns of a movement over a sustained period of time, it suggests a remarkable deftness on his part to describe and promote his own fierce independence while also respecting those of his fellow artists and without homogenizing the singular artistic vision for a simpler collective narrative. So much of Motherwell's sensibilities as a communicator and as an artist were developed by his unconventional route into art. He has no formal training in art and had undergone a purely academic education. Although Motherwell is seen as a first generation abstract expressionist, he was the youngest within the group of key artists. And born in 1915, he was over 10 years younger than Arshil Gorky, Willem de Kooning, Barnett Newman, Mark Rothko, Adolf Gottlieb and Clifford Still nine years younger than David Smith, and it was only Jackson Pollock, Franz Klein, and Philip Guston, and Ad Reinhardt, and William Baziotis, who were born in the same decade, with all being at least three years older than Motherwell. Motherwell was actually still in school when the first artists who would go on to be known as abstract expressionists first converged in New York in the mid-1920s. Again, against the backdrop of the Great Depression, Gottlieb and Newman, were native New Yorkers, so they were already there. Rothko arrived via Yale in 1923. Gorky, who had emigrated from Armenia, arriving in the US in 1920, finally reached New York in 24. Still arrived in 25, Smith in 26, de Kooning in 27, a year after he'd emigrated from Rotterdam. And amongst the younger group, Pollock was there by 1930, Klein and Guston following in 35 and 36, respectively. Motherwell first arrived in New York in 1940 at the age of 25. His late arrival meant that he had missed a lot. He acknowledged that himself at many, at many points, recognizing the value of the early connections and camaraderie between the artists which had developed, particularly by virtue of events or programs which pulled them together, such as art classes and social contact at the Art Students League in New York, where some of the artists were, were taught, Pollock studied there under um, Thomas Hart Benton, and others were teachers or regularly attended the life drawing classes. The Works Progress Administration's Federal Art Program, which ran from 1935 to 1943, also brought many of the emerging artists together. 
for many giving them a regular stipend for the first time. But working on this program brought other benefits to the young artists employed on it. It pulled numbers of them together, creating a society of like-minded artists. It also persuaded some, for example, de Kooning, that his destiny lay in being an artist, and he resolved soon, soon after to focus on that alone, despite the deprivations it would bring. Major artistic figures, such as the French artist Ferdinand Léger, were appointed group leaders, allowing the American artist to gain a remarkable and up-close insight into European modernism, as well as to observe the life of a successful, mature artist. The projects to design and paint murals shifted many artists' engagement with the question of scale. While, while most started working at an easel, a large number went on to paint murals and in doing so developed an interest in, and in many cases direct connections with, the South Amer American muralist painters. Importantly, the program did not follow the public's inclination to favor figurative art over abstraction, and non-representational um, artists and sculptors were free to express their own artistic impulse. The growing unrest in Europe also meant that many European painters were coming to the United States and New York for their personal safety. The German-born artist and teacher Hans Hoffmann, whose time in Paris created a direct link for, to European modernism, arrived in 1930, and his fervent interest in and deep knowledge of European artists and movements were passed on to the young New York-based artists, who he soon befriended. A few years after his arrival, his enduring mission to teach saw him set up an art school where he tutored some key abstract expressionist artists, um, including Lee Krasner, so it was mostly second generation abstract expressionists. But friendships and allegiances between artists were also established at this time, and by the 1920s, Rothko, Gottlieb and Newman had developed a close friendship, much of it centered around the older figurative artist and colorist, Milton Avery. Rothko and Gottlieb would go on to be founder members of a group of expressionist painters called the Ten, who would exhibit work together for the next five years. The painter and Russian emigre John Graham was like Hoffman, another direct link to Paris, and Graham was on the periphery of Rothko's group, being a close friend of Milton Avery's, and he and the artist Stuart Davis also formed close friendships with Arshil Gorky and Willem de Kooning, and later David Smith. They were known to meet regularly and endlessly discuss art in all its manifestations, and it was Graham who first introduced Smith to the welded sculpture of Picasso and Gonzalez, setting his course for the development of his own style. He also organized the itinerary for Smith's trip to Paris, focusing it on visiting artist studios. Throw into all of this the burgeoning art scene with the opening of the Museum of Modern Art under the direction of Alfred Barr, and the mixed program of exhibitions of global note and reach, which were organized under his direction, as well as the opening of the Whitney and other commercial galleries. Although the climate for artists remained unrelentingly hard in terms of economy and recognition, the intellectual environment for artists was most certainly on an upward trajectory. That was the point at which Motherwell arrived in New York and entered this world. And given that Motherwell was 10 years younger, and that although he demonstrated a long interest in art while pursuing his academic studies, which had shifted from literature through philosophy and then into art history, he had only just recently committed to become an artist, following a year spent in France, ostensibly to study literature there, but where he also painted and drew throughout his time, absorbing energy and inspiration from the vibrant artistic life in Paris. And once Motherwell was committed to being an artist, he did so with a fervor, and this fervor connected him quickly to aspects of artistic life in the city. Studying art history under Mayor Shapiro at Columbia University from 1940 to 41 not only bro broadened his art historical knowledge, but he also benefited from Shapiro's direct connections to the art world. Motherwell recounts with some humor that when he was taking a course with Shapiro on Picasso, he himself was painting all evening and frequently went round to Shapiro's house late at night, he lived nearby, to ask his opinion on his latest works. Exasperated by the frequency of these visits, Shapiro kindly suggested that Motherwell needed, what he really needed was to talk to other artists and he would take it upon himself to introduce him to some. 
So this is, um, this is Mother Well, who has, has been introduced to, to many of these characters. So we've got Max Ernst at the top, Peggy Guggenheim, and then sitting below is Roberta Matta and his wife. On Shapiro's introduction, Motherwell began to work and take instruction in the studio of the artist Kurt Seligman, one of the first European surrealist artists to arrive in the US. And there, over the course of a year, Motherwell gained a number of practical skills of art making, as well as getting to know and understanding Seligman's art. The two became friends, and before long, Motherwell was hanging out with the Parisian surrealist exiles, and in a few weeks, he knew them all. He enjoyed their company and recognized that they were very much a cohesive group. And later, looking back on this time, he noted that they were the only real gang of artists that he had ever known. The Chilean artist, Roberta Mata, who's in this photograph, who was part of the Surrealist movement, had spent time in Paris with, with his fellow members. And he was the artist to which Motherwell gravitated towards the most. By all accounts, Matter was charismatic and a passionate communicator in the subject of art. He was younger than the French Surrealist by about 20 years, a similar age to Motherwell. And Motherwell described him as the most energetic, poetic, charming, brilliant, and enthusiastic artist he had ever met. In 1941, Motherwell went to Mexico with Matter for a few months, where he also met Wolfgang Palin, another Surrealist painter and thinker. This was a formative moment for Motherwell. Not only through his companions did he rapidly absorb a comprehensive understanding of surrealism, but he also assimilated Mexican and Hispanic culture, which were to find expression in his work. And on returning from Mexico, Motherwell gave up his studies in Colombia, and his course was set for life as an artist. As Alfred Barr clearly pointed out, all the abstract expressionist artists were individuals, and this is very much in evidence in the differing routes they took as they arrived at their various mature styles. While many of them encountered surrealism, both directly from the Parisian exiles or indirectly through exhibitions of their work or writing, André Breton's Manifesto and Surrealism was published in 1924, they absorbed it in differing ways and, and intensities and through a variety of channels and exponents. It is undoubtedly the case that surrealism proved to be an important source, or one of many important sources, for the development of abstract expressionism style overall. Matter was always trying to find ways of challenging Breton's authority, and he attempted to engage some of the young New York artists to develop a new form of surrealism. Motherwell showed some interest with Pollock and Baziotis to a lesser extent. Gorky was also deeply interested, but he had, trod, he had trod a much more individual path, always avoiding being associated with any tendency. De Kooning, on the other hand, expressed his disinterest in engaging, as he put it, with any surrealist adventure. To illustrate these very varying engagements with the surrealist movement, I have a few examples of the young artist's work, including Motherwell's, dating from the early 40s, with each suggesting the assimilation of selected surrealist elements into their work. So first, just for its kind of context, I've got a, a painting by um, Roberta Matta, um, which is called Years of Fear from 1941. And it's a good example of Matta's surrealist work. It's, it's a comment on the war. And like many of Matta's work, the foundation is the landscape from which he expands out into a fantastical dreamlike scene. And his technique of very thinly applying the color, often rubbing it away in parts, adds to the sense of the, the mystical impact of the work. And his method of using very thin down paint was a technique which was passed on to Gorky. And this is Gorky's garden in Sochi motif from 1942. And Gorky's adoption of this more fluid way of applying paint, along with his, his, his flirtation with surrealism, contributed to his taking a different approach to his work. And this led on to an unlocking of his own style, which was seen in his late and important body of work from the early 40s when he first met Mata to his death in 1948. This late body of work by Gorky, when he was fusing elements of surrealism with synthetic cubism, in many ways set the path for the development of abstract expressionism. And it was Gorky's translation of these two European movements which proved to be an important step forward. And so here's a mother well, and, and this is one of the, um, the works that's in the exhibition here. It's a marvelous drawing, three-figure shot, which dates from 1944. 
And as the title suggests, there's a reference to violence or death, which is an enduring theme throughout Motherwell's work. But whether in this case it's related to the end of the Second World War or the Mexican Revolution or both is not completely clear. But the clever use of colour in the background and the seductive reds and pinks of the shot marks reduces the figure's dominance in a very effective way. <coughs> Motherwell is taking visual aspects of surrealism and affecting a translation of them into a form which is easier to decipher for an American audience. He also, even at this early stage in his career, seems to instinctively understand the need to make art that is relevant to the culture of his time. And then to give a sense of other abstract expressionist artists' adoption of some of the surrealist traditions of their work, this is a drawing by Mark Rothko, um, which dates from around the same time as Motherwell's drawing. Um, it's untitled and therefore is more difficult to read without the title gives no hint at all. Um, and, um, but like Motherwell's work, the forms are rooted um, within the composition as if they're on solid ground. He also, like Motherwell's work, uses negative space very effectively and the fluid nature of the paint lends itself to automatism. This is a painting by Rothko um, around the same time, 44, slow swirl at the edge of the sea. And this, this work is larger. Um, the upright forms are closer to Motherwell's, um, from Motherwell's drawings. The oil is thinner here. But um, in, in, um, I don't think, like uh, uh, Gorky, that they are, are imitating matter. I think that he's more influenced in the way he's using paint and creating these glazes. He's more influenced by um, Milton Avery's techniques at this stage. And we can see the divisions already in the canvas, which would lead to the later, um, the, ne the next stage of his developments, which was the um, multiform works, which started to emerge in 1947. And then this wonderful painting by Jackson Pollock, Male and Female, which dates from 1942-43. Um, again, surrealist influence is very present, and like in Rothko and Motherwell's works, the human form is very much evoked. But whereas Motherwell's drawing suggests violence and Rothko's compositions are full of mystery, this composition by Pollock is replete of pe with pent-up energy and an explosion of colour, and it very much presages the drip paintings which were to follow soon after. I've just included a work by Adolf Gottlieb as well, one of his classic pictogram symbols. And like Motherwell, Gottlieb actually spent a, a, quite a long stretch of time in Paris when he was at the end of his, his teens. And he had focused all his energies when he was there on engaging with art. So he would have encountered aspects of early surrealism before the influx of the surrealist exiles in New York. His pictogram works very much bear the imprint of this. So it is clear in the course of the individual development of a number of the young artists and throughout the early stages of their mature careers that they were approaching external influences, in this case surrealism, in very different ways. None of them were going to adhere to Breton's rule book. The surrealist movement didn't just refer to art but extended to literature and philosophy and politics and was very much an intellectual movement in the true sense. And given his own educational background, perhaps it was inevitable that Motherwell would engage with his principles more fully and in a more sustained way than many of his, his fellow American artists. I mentioned automatism earlier when I referenced the Rothko drawing. An automatism or psychic automatism was a fundamental principle in surrealism. The process encourages a sense of the unconscious mind at work during the execution of a painting or drawing. The fully conscious mind is somehow subjugated. One of the products of, of, of Pollock and Baziotti's fleeting connection with the surrealist movement was a fascinating um, a collaborative painting which was done with Jerome Kamrowski and actually done in his studio. Um, and it shows some early elements of uh, Pollock's later drip paintings. It's a fascinating work. And then this is a, a wonderful example of Motherwell's adoption of automatism and was, was more profound. And he talked later about the excitement that it brought. And it was during his time in Mexico, 1941, with Mata, that Motherwell first employed this way of working. And in the rem uh, remarkable Mexican sketchbook drawings, Motherwell is, ex is experimenting with this highly personal form of expression. And the link to literature and psychology added an additional layer of interest for him, and he'd long admired this aspect in James, James Joyce's writings, 
referring to him as a master of automatism. And these early sketches also take influence from matter, and like his friend, Motherwell frequently evokes elements of the landscape in these works. He wrote later about how he saw this process as a vehicle to unlock a new way of painting, not just for him, but for all of them. He wrote, Gorky was copying Picasso, Pollock was copying Picasso, de Kooning was copying Picasso, I was painting French intimate pictures or whatever, and all we needed was a creative principle. And I thought of all the possibilities of free association because I also had a psychoanalytic background and I understood the, the implications. It, and it might be the best chance to really make something entirely new, which everyone agreed was the thing to do. Over 20 years after the Mexican sketchbook drawings, Motherwell engaged once again with the principle of surrealism when he suffered an uncharacteristic painting block. And in order to work through it, he determined to do a series of drawings with, as he put it, or without, as he put it, any a priori judgment or any later adjustment, but just to leave the execution of each work down to pure chance. And working in this way with the paper on the floor and bending over it, as was his custom, he produced 565 works, which, were, which are known as the Lyric Suite. And the exercise reawakened his passion for psychic automatism. And examples from this remarkable body of work are here in the exhibition. The Lyric se series and its execution suggest the link for Motherwell between his paintings and drawings. He is primarily a painter, but and as this exhibition demonstrates, drawings were, were from the start a fundamental aspect of his creative output, and the speed and immediacy of his drawings was something that he valued in and of itself. And the way he was able to explore ideas with rapidity in the process of executing it um, helped to develop a relationship with later painting compositions. Because Motherwell was one of the first abstract group of artists to connect effectively with surrealism, reshaping it and adapting aspects of it for his own artistic development, it seemed to give him an impetus. Although it is important to add, and this is the case not just for Motherwell but for all the young artists, that they were all open to a number of different possible influences when working their way towards their mature style. For example, Motherwell discovered the work of Piet Mondrian in 1942. An engagement with Mondrian's work and the artist himself found, a, found expression in his work. And as he was increasingly to do, Motherwell also wrote about Mondrian's work, further engaging with it in a more theoretical way. I've already noted that Motherwell was well aware that he had missed some key moments to commun commune with other artists. It is perhaps also worthy of, of mention that the painterly journey most of these artists took saw each, to varying degrees, develop their art from pure figuration. This was a step which barely existed for Motherwell. Aside from some derivative early paintings made in Paris, often uh, replicated from postcards and inspired by the Impressionist work he saw there, his mature style both commenced and continued primarily with an abstract and figurative abstract vocabulary. In contrast, artists such as Rothko, Gottlieb, and Klein in particular had a solid body of fairly accomplished figurative work already in their back catalogue. This past connection with an eventual elimination of figuration in their work made the abstract expressionist artist's rejection and repudiation of the regionalist painters with their particular stance on the representation of a socio-political subject, and by extension, their rejection of European modernism and individualism, particularly heartfelt. Many would have supported Gorky's words in describing the regionalist painters at a public debate as poor art for poor people. Perhaps the fact that Motherwell had largely missed this struggle at the grassroots level in the 1930s meant that his more intellectual celebration of the individual artist's expression through their art came through an unadulterated and non-political position and was therefore possibly more effective. He later referred to this essential quality as ethical consciousness and suggested that if it's not present in the composition, the painter was merely a decorator. 
Motherwell himself commented on the eventual recognition in the form of solo, uh, their eventual recognition in the, in the form of solo exhibitions for the abstract expressionist artists, and it came in waves. And although the youngest of the group, he was part of the first wave, along with Pollock, Baziotis, Gottlieb, Reinhardt, Hoffman, and Pousset Dart, when they all had solo exhibitions over a short period of time at the Peggy Guggenheim Art of This Century. What was particularly gratifying to all of these artists was the association the gallery had to European modernism by virtue of Peggy Guggenheim's amazing collection, as well as her showing of key European artists and therefore the individual and collective connections in which the young artist's work was being positioned. Pollock's first exhibition with Guggenheim was in February 1944, with Motherwell having a one-man show a few months later. Both had been included, along with Baziotis, in a group exhibition the year before, the, um, the exhibition of Collage. And this is a, a, an image of their Motherwell solo exhibition at the Art of This Century, very beautifully installed. All of Motherwell's work was recent for this exhibition, executed in the past two or three years, and it included paintings, collage, prints, and drawings. Um, and there was very much a Mexican-Spanish theme to the body of work, with most of the works on paper were, being, were actually sold during the run of the exhibition, which was unusual, actually, for the young artist to make sales so quickly. There was also a program for the, um, for the exhibition, which is a wonderful thing to, to see. Motherwell had become close to Pollock, as close as was possible. And apart from their engagement in art, Motherwell felt that their shared upbringing in the West of America had afforded them similar childhood experiences of the outdoors and hunting. And given the eventual scale of both of their canvases, each capturing what Pollock once referred to as America's awful bigness, is suggested in their work. Motherwell was also close to William Baziotis, but amongst all the abstract expressionists, it was the sculptor, David Smith, who he described as being like a brother. And he recounts how Smith had encouraged him to spend time at the studio in Bolton Landing and exper experiment working in three dimensions, which some, somewhat perplexed um, Motherwell at, at the time, and he never took up the offer. But David Smith was actually one of the first abstract expressionist artists to have a solo exhibition at Willard's Gallery in 1938. And then, as I mentioned, Clifford Still um, showed at the Art of the Century in 46. Rothko showed first at Betty Parsons in 47. De Kooning at Charles Egan in 48, where he showed his black and white work. Barnett Newman at Betty Parsons in 1950. And Franz Klein at Charles Egan in 1950. And all of the artists very much supported themselves in their exhibitions, often helping to paint the galleries and hang the work. Motherwell wrote the catalogue essay for one of Smith's exhibitions, and he painted the walls and helped Baziotis hung, hang his gallery, The Art of the Century. They were used to being each other's audience and critics during their shared lengthy period of non-recognition, and then took the role of supporter when their work was at last seen and then repudiated. Motherwell's deep love of books and literature extended into his life as an artist, and he was involved in writing for many catalogues and volumes and editing publications throughout his career. In 1944, he commenced editing the first of 14 volumes of the Documents of Modern Art, a series devoted to the writings of artists. Like his lectures, his writing is beautiful, considered, clear, and insightful, and when the subject is his own work and his approach to it, and as is always, also can be seen in his art, he holds himself to account, referring to the act of painting as being a constant criticism of oneself. Debate and discussion were an important activity for Motherwell and the abstract expressionist artists. And this is a, a, a wonderful photo of an artist session at Studio 35. Um, and Motherwell is at the head of the table next to Alfred Barr. Um, with, uh, I think there's 20-something um, students, uh, uh, um, artists sitting around him. Um, and you can, I, I don't know if you can see any familiar faces there, but there's quite a few people there. De Kooning's there, Gottlieb, um, Pousset Dart. Um, 
it was at Studio 35 was, a, was another place for artists to come and debate their work. And it had originally been part of the, um, the subjects of the artist school, which Motherwell had set up with others in 1948, and which only lasted a year. But Studio 35 ran for a further year. Um, until 1950, when they all agreed it had got very repetitive because people used to come and ask the same questions all the time, so they felt that they kind of exhausted it. Um, and this, this photograph actually marks the closing day of a three-day symposium. Um, and, and Alfred Barr, it was, it was quite, quite something to have him there, but Alfred Barr also used to come along and, and um, attend many of the club sessions that the artists held. Um, and these, these sessions at Studio 35 were recorded and later published in Modern Artists in America. Um, and the transcripts are very, very interesting, you know, very intellectual conversations. And this was the meeting, um, this last session, when um, Adolf Gottlieb um, suggested drafting a letter in protest against the Metropolitan um, Art Museum's upcoming juried exhibition, American Painting Today, which of course led to the, the now legendary Irascible's photograph and article. And for Motherwell, teaching was very much another, um, and debating were very much another method of dissemination, and all of the artists had to support themselves in some ways, and many of them did teach. And Motherwell did stints of teaching, both at his own short-lived schools, Black Mountain College as well. And in 1950, he joined the graduate um, faculty at Hunter College, where he um, continued to, to teach until 1958. And just to give a sense of the, the, their kind of constant integration, this is a wonderful photograph of Mark Rothko, um, uh, Bradley Walker Tomlin, and, um, and Robert Motherwell. Um, and the, the picture on the wall is Motherwell's voyage. Um, and it just it, it kind of just reinforces the point to how they connected in so many levels. But I think what's also interesting here, and I find it quite amusing actually, is is you can you can see the similar size of all of the canvases, suggesting they all kept a pace with each other, um, even though they, they did it from very individualistic standpoints. Um, but by the 1950s, by the time this photograph was taken, all of the artists had very much um, achieved their mature styles, had arrived at that point. So, um, Jackson Pollock, um, number, number 31, one number 31. Motherwell spoke about Pollock's wildness, and these large paintings were very much a manifestation of that. And this was the point that, that Jackson was, um, Pollock was really being discovered, and his celebrity, as, as de Kooning put it, broke the eyes for the other artists. In reference to his fellow artist's work at this time, Motherwell pointed out that the difference between European abstraction and abstract expressionism was the violence in it, and he felt that this was a particularly American phenomenon. This is de Kooning's first woman, his woman one. Um, and, and Motherwell also opined on, on the, 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 uh, the violence in um, de Kooning's work, saying in, in, in this particular work it was unparalleled. And then this is one of Rothko's first classic, classic works. Um, Motherwell and Rothko were good friends as well. And in, 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 um, like all of the artists, they endlessly spoke about um, art and, and their work. And one of the things that Motherwell noted was that, that Rothko suggested to him that one of his frustrations was that people failed to see the aggression in his work. And I think it's kind of interesting that we associate Rothko's work very much with um, contemplation, but, but Rothko felt that there was a lot of aggression in there that somehow people weren't quite, quite seeing. Um, and, and then I've included a work by Barnett Newman. This is Vir Heroica Sublim, Sublimis, and from 1950-51. It's the largest work that he ever executed. It's absolutely enormous. Um, and Newman was uh, asked the question, if we are living in a time without a legend that can be called sublime, how can we be creating sublime art? And I think this painting is very much a, um, a, a manifestation of that statement. And then Motherwell's Elegy to the Spanish Republic. All of these works were quite literally throwing down the gauntlet. As Motherwell had said, they were a group of artists who had been embattled, and this was the moment that they'd come out fighting. They'd all paid a personal price for the freedom to challenge what went before and to find their own artistic paths, and all of them had striven to achieve truth and authenticity in their work. 
This is a, a later image of, of Motherwell working in the studio in one of his elegies. And he had a tendency to work in series, and the elegy series was the most sustained and profound of his career. And he developed and explored it through paintings and through drawings, which can be seen in this exhibition. And it first emerged as a drawing illustration for a poem by the art critic and writer and friend, Harold Rosenberg, which is in MoMA's collection and has been lent to this exhibition. So it's just an extraordinary thing to have here. As Motherwell later pointed Pointed out the composition is not directly related to the poem, but rather it is connected to the feelings elicited by it. And the image was um, for a magazine article which was never published, and Motherwell came upon the, the image at a time of despair and generated a painting, taking the key comp um, compositional elements from the drawing and altering them while retaining the recognisable form. And again, this was inspired by another poem, in this case, um, Lorca, a poem which was a lament for death, an elegy leading to the eventual title. And throughout his life, Motherwell um, completed up to 150 paintings in this series, with many uh, later ones being of monumental scale. The open series was inspired by a chance sight of the relationship between a small canvas resting against a larger one. Outlining this in charcoal led to a series of works on paper and on canvas using this form. It has very close connections to European modernist painting. Matisse's um, view of Notre Dame immediately springs to mind. And like the Elegy series, the endless inventiveness and dependence on subtleties of composition and modulations of color enabled Motherwell to run through different cadences in each work. And it's something that I, I, I feel must have inspired Jasper Johns when he started doing the same thing with um, his number flag and, um, and uh, map series. So this is um, Robert Motherwell's uh, um, Pancho Villa, Dead, Dead or Alive, um, from 1943, so a very early work, um, and a collage. It was Peggy Guggenheim who initiated Motherwell's focus on collage. She had asked Matta in 1943 to encourage Motherwell, Pollock, and Baziotis to produce some collage work to include in a mixed exhibition on the subject with the aim of combining the work with a new contemporary, um, with, with, uh, with uh, European modernist paintings as um, artists as well. And in fact, I should point out, by virtue of her exhibition programming, which suggested that the young New York abstract painters were the next chapter on from her European modernist they were sharing space with, Guggenheim played a really important part in shifting the center of the arts from Europe to America, even if it was not by design. Motherwell immediately took to collage, and like the elegies in his other series, it became a consistent but ever-changing strand that ran through his entire career. And for a number of years, he was the only American artist who continued to work in collage. This early work, um, with the wood veneer and patterned paper, clearly acknowledges the masters of the medium, Braque and Picasso. And Motherwell remembered observing Picasso at the De Magot when he was in Paris as a young man, arranging objects on the white tablecloth as if configuring elements for a collage. And it was only later that Motherwell realized that this experience had been an instructive one from the inventor of the form, and perhaps the reason why Motherwell himself adopted it so readily. In 1946, Motherwell wrote about the process of collage in an essay, Beyond the Aesthetic, which highlights how different a creative act it is from drawing or painting and why for him it was so compelling. The sensation of physically operating on the world is very strong in the medium of pa papier collé or collage, in which various kinds of paper are, passed to the, are pasted to the canvas. One cuts and chooses and shifts and pastes and sometimes tears off and begins again, in any case shaping and arranging such a, a, a re relational structure obliterates the need and often the awareness of representation without reference to likeness it possesses feelings because all the, the decisions in regard to it we are ultimately made on the grounds of feeling. 
Then this is a later one, which is in the exhibition here. The reference to Gull was, of course, goes right back to Picasso. And made in 1972, it was around 25 years from his first collage. And Motherwell may have started late compared to his fellow abstract expressionist artists, but his career stretched out at the other end. And by the end of 1970, Gorky, Pollock, Smith, Klein, Reinhardt, Newman, and Rothko were all dead. And some of the few left, like de Kooning, having been so resistant to have been labeled in the 1940s as an abstract expressionist, was railing against the new generation of artists who were ruining the movement. But Motherwell was able to achieve that remarkable thing of remaining true to the principles embodied in the abstract expressionist movement, which had motivated him as an artist in the first place, eventually bringing him recognition, but at the same time to subject them and himself to the inevitable cultural changes which were going on around him. This goes back to Motherwell's long-held belief that the artist should be true to and connect with and reflect the age and culture in which he lives. He continued to be celebrated as an artist up to the end of his life with multiple muse museum exhibitions um, during his life and as we can testify beyond. So artists coming up immediately behind Motherwell would have seen him as both connected to the past but also being of the present. And his collage work connected Braque and Picasso to Rauschenberg and Johns. This is, this is just to, to stress his commitment. He had a, a dedicated collage studio, which I think is rather wonderful. And it's without a doubt, this is uh, Rauschenberg's um, rhyme from 1956, it's without a doubt that Rauschenberg's work was, did inspire, um, uh, was inspired by, by Motherwell. I've included this work um, because I, I had it in the exhibition of abstract expressionism, which I, I did at the, um, um, curated at the Royal Academy in 2016. And it was, it's a remarkable Motherwell painting, and it's one that I got to look at every day. I was just talking to Edward about the wonderful thing about being a curator for an institution is you, you feel you own the works for three months, and you go in and look at them every day, and this is one of the ones I looked at every day. Um, and I think it's, it's the most remarkable work. And just to situate it within the exhibition, this is a, a long view um, through the, the galleries, and Motherwell's work, which isn't in view, is just to the si side of the, the Franz Klein. And I think what's so interesting, actually, is, is looking at the abstract expressionists together from our perspective is how closely linked but different they are at the same time. There's this incredible dialogue between the Kleins and the Motherwell, which I just showed you. There's a Smith that you can see side on in the, in the, in the middle. And then you go through two galleries. The first one is filled with de Kooning's, the second one with Newman and, um, and Reinhardt. And then beyond, you've got Motherwell's Elegy, um, which dates from um, its Elegy to the Republic number 126 from 1965 to M75. Um, and, and absolutely stunning work, one of the biggest works that he made. So I've never been comfortable about um, the term self-appointed spokesperson of abstract expressionism when referring to Motherwell, as it's got slight connotations of self-aggrandizement, which is just simply not the case. And it also suggests that the other artists were not able to speak to themselves. And again, all were highly intelligent and articulate with many, Newman and Rothko, for example, very accomplished writers and art. Plus, Motherwell was a collaborator, taking part in the club meetings, but certainly not always playing a leading role. And to add to this argument, the premise for the short-lived school he founded with other artists was to ensure that no artistic figure or tendency would dominate the student's learning. He was a Democrat. And perhaps of more concern, the term spokesperson for abstract expressionism can overshadow the importance of his art and and this is most important, he was an artist first. But going back to the quote I read earlier about every intelligent artist carrying the whole culture of modern painting in his head, Motherwell had an ability to step back and, and observe what he and his peers were doing within a historical context. His coining of the expression School of New York was a challenge to the School of Paris and it suggests that there was a battle to win this prize. 
and by both his art and his communication, he eased and described this epic collective journey for a number of artists, including himself. He wrote regarding this, that in the belief that the essence of life is to be found in the frustrations of the established order, we were trying to revise modern painting in relation to some of its obvious frustrations so that painting would, rep would represent our sense of reality better, this general tendency each of us followed in his own way. Today, we continue to be engaged and inspired by Motherwell's interpretation of the essence of life. Thank you. I haven't left much time, but I'm happy to take one or two questions, if there are and, any. And I have a mic here, so just raise your hand if you... There's one just there, Tony. Where? Raise your hand. To your left. Where were the women at that table? <laughs> Where were the women of abstract expressionism? I guess they weren't shown very much, or? They were there. They were there. I mean, most of the women were, were, were second generation, so I mentioned Lee Krasner, but um, uh, um, Joan Mitchell, of course, and, and uh, Louise Nevelson. Um, I, I, I am happy to, to say that in, my ex in the exhibition at the Royal Academy, we did have women artists. So um, we, we, they were represented, but... but the focus was on Motherwell and his, his, his group of, of close associates. Of course, I didn't mention, because I, I couldn't say everything, but he, he was married to Helen Frankenthaler, who was a second-generation abstract expressionist and a fabulous artist. And her work did, um, did influence his. I mean, they, they, you know, it was kind of really interesting looking at how their work changed during that time. I couldn't cover everything. I'm sorry. <laughs> Well, I think we're, 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 we're nearly at 8 o'clock anyway, so perhaps if, if there's no more questions, I'll, I'll thank you all for attending. Thank you. Thank you.